Bankless Nation, a special bonus episode for you today. And I think an important one, we have a ledger on the episode today. The question in our minds, are the private keys safe? We have the chief security officer of Ledger and we ask him that question along with a number of other questions related to this new recovery product that they just launched. David, uh, who's on the episode today? We have Charles Guillaume, uh, who we've actually recently had on the podcast. He taught us how to properly spin up a private key. So Charles does know a thing or two about hardware wallets and and how to secure a private key. Uh, and so today, I think we actually learned quite a lot about what is actually under the hood of a hardware wallet and what is the fundamental nature of a hardware wallet. I think this is a conversation that the entire industry is working through right now. And I think this this episode will be very, very useful to understand exactly the topics of discussion that we are having both in public and on this episode. Before we get there though, we're gonna talk about our sp- friends and sponsor at Consensus because they have a brand new product. This one's for all the devs out there. A cool new code auditing tool with a sick new name. Diligence fuzzing. <laughs> Ever thought about that, Ryan? Diligence, Diligence fuzzing? fuzzing? No. For smart Wait, contract solidity devs, auditors, and enterprises who are engaging in Web3 that need to ainsure their smart contracts are secure before proceeding to mainnet. Diligence fuzzing is an audit-grade security tool that serves for the most automated way to test code and find vulnerabilities without having to host their own infrastructure and so writing So fuzzes is just, cases. you just try all this, you try to d- try to break it basically. That's what fuzzing yes. is. Yeah, so the idea is, what it, what is fuzzing? You set some parameters that are incorrect and correct as an output, and then you throw an infinite number of numbers in as inputs, and if there ever comes out as an invalid, you can kind of test it. That just was my non devy way of explaining this. <laughs> you gotta fuzz People it. who needed to have fuzzing explained to them did not need this product. <laughs> These are for this one's for the devs. Uh, so diligence fuzzing is just an extra layer of protection for your smart contracts. In addition to and beyond typical code audits, there is a link in the show notes to get started uh, if you want to get started doing your diligence fuzzing by robots. Well, fuzzing you know robots. what? We're going to do some ledger fuzzing right now because <laughs> we are ledger fuzzing. In yeah. And episode, so yeah. Uh, we are recording this intro after we've already done the episode mm-hmm. with uh, Charles from Ledger. And so I think it was a fantastic episode myself. I'm yeah, really I interested to hear what the community thinks. Um, this is an education episode. We um, ask, I think, some difficult questions of Charles at Ledger. And he gives his response. I do feel like we did get down to the bottom of it. Like we got down to the root of the problem. And I, feel I pretty personally good about that. feel like I have closure in. Yes. I, I would closure. say understanding what the security posture of this hardware device that I own called a ledger, understanding what that actually is. I feel like after this episode, I understand it much more. Now it'll be up to bankless listeners to decide whether that is the security posture they uh, they want to move forward with and continue using. But um, yeah, this is a successful episode from that perspective to me. Uh, one small disclosure, Ledger is a previous Bankless sponsor. They are not a current Bankless sponsor. And with that, let's go ahead and get right into the episode so we can learn exactly how a hardware wallet works with Charles from Ledger. But first, I want to talk about these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible, especially Kraken, our preferred exchange for 2020. Three, if you do not have any Kraken account, consider signing up. Kraken Pro has easily become the best crypto trading platform in the industry. The place I use to check the charts and the crypto prices, even when I'm not looking to place a trade. On Kraken Pro, you'll have access to advanced charting tools, real-time market data, and lightning fast trade execution, all inside their spiffy new modular interface. Kraken's new customizable modular layout lets you tailor your trading experience to suit your needs. Pick and choose your favorite modules and place them anywhere you want in your screen. With Kraken Pro, you have that power. Whether you are a season pro or just starting out, join thousands of traders who trust Kraken Pro for their crypto trading needs. Visit pro.kraken.com to get started today. Mantle is a brand new high performance Ethereum layer two network built differently from the other layer twos you may be familiar with. Mantle is a modular layer two built on the OP stack, but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum layer one. Not only does this reduce Mantle's gas fees by 80% compared to other layer twos, but it also reduces gas fee volatility. Mantle has a decentralized sequencer set, eliminating the risk of downtime and censorship on the network. And because Mantle implements multi-party computation 
documentation notes, layer one settlement execution is shortened from seven days to as low as just one or two. Mantle is the first layer two built by a DAO and is backed by one of the biggest DAO treasuries in the world, BitDAO. Mantle already has sub communities from around Web3 onboarded to help the growth of Mantle, like Game7 for Web3 gaming, or EduDAO for the world of DeSide, and Bybit for TVL, liquidity, and on ramps. Check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. Immutable is at the forefront of Web3 gaming, on a mission to bring digital ownership to every player, offering the world's best games and game development platform. Immutable lets game builders and players focus on great gaming experiences. So build your next Web3 game on easy mode with Immutable's leading full stack Web3 gaming platform. Its built-in UX features like the Immutable Passport are designed for games to scale to the next billion players coming to Web3. With Immutable, players can sign up with an email, pay with a credit card, and experience a frictionless purchase flow inside of games. So discover your next favorite game and explore a network of 150 games building on Immutable, including such titles as Gauze Unchained, Guilds of Guardians, Illuvium, Ember Sword, and Metalcore. So join Web3's largest ecosystem of games and players. Build, play, and connect at immutable.com. Bankless Nation, I'd love to introduce you to Charles Guillaume, who joined Ledger in 2017 as Chief Security Officer after working for 10 years in the world of cryptography and hardware security sector. Charles, welcome back to Bankless. Hi, David. Thanks for having me. So just want to dive right into the, the subject at hand here. Uh, the context, uh, as I understand it, and we're coming into this episode very, very quickly. So uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to correct this context if I get this wrong. Um, yesterday, Ledger launched its Recover service that lets users back up their private keys so that it could be recovered if lost. Uh, this Recover service splits up private keys into three different encrypted shards sent out from the device to be held separately by three uh, different custodians, also perhaps including Ledger. Uh, the strategy here is that we know in crypto that private keys are a huge hurdle for adoption and many people just don't want to manage their own private keys and Re Ledger Recover is meant to be a solution. Uh, let the professionals do the professional thing and manage your uh, private keys on your behalf is an opt-in service. Um, but this opt-in service is not exactly the source of the outrage coming from the crypto world. Uh, Ledger users previously thought that it was impossible for private keys to ever leave their existing Ledger devices, as is this is the point of a hardware wallet after all. Uh, so now Ledger has released this firmware update that seems to make this possible, albeit in a highly secure, encrypted, and sharded fashion. The point remains that something that was once thought impossible is now actually learned to be possible and has possibly been possible this entire time. Uh, so Charles, is this an accurate summary, summary from your perspective and what would you add? Yeah, I think part of the feedback we uh, got from the community were about this this part, but there was also uh, like uh, some misunderstanding around the feature, what it does, why we uh, want to release this and so on. And maybe I can start with that. Like the, the intent of um, this feature is to bring more people to uh, secure self-custody because when you zoom out, we are in, in the little bubble, uh, like uh, tech-savvy people. But when you zoom out, uh, today most crypto owners are using exchanges uh, to custody their assets or are using software wallets. And the reality is that self-custody seems a little bit complex, maybe is a little bit complex for newcomers and, and people can be afraid of it. And for me, there are two major uh, friction points in, self in the self-custody journey. And I often uh, think about my mother. Uh, it's too complex. Like Self-custody is too complex for her because I see two major uh, friction points. And the first one is the understanding and management of secret keys. Like These things are quite complex. If you are not used to, uh, to know what is a secret key and so on, it's, it's complex. Uh, I mean, you mean I have to uh, write down these 20, 24 words? What do I do with these words and so on? When, when you are not tech savvy, this thing uh, can be um, uh, frightening. And the second thing is like understanding what you sign and consent. There, there are these exaditional addresses, all this stuff. When you do smart contract interaction, it can be a little bit complex. So for me, there's two uh, major uh, friction points needs to be addressed by Ledger. Um, and we need to, to find a way for newcomers for, for mass in order to uh, enable mass adoption. And in self-custody, I think there are different shades of gray, different level of, level of trust. 
at the extreme uh, left, you have like a full trustless uh, model where you don't trust anyone. You build your own computer, you, your own operating system, your own wallet, you, and so on. You generate your own secrets, you manage your, your backup, you build the tools to synchronize the blockchain and sign. Like This would be the extreme uh, trustless model very difficult to achieve um, and uh, quite uh, it, it needs a lot of skills time and, and so on and the, uh, at the extreme right you have like the the custodian model where people are completely trusting a third party to manage their assets and in between you have like different shade of gray and you have software wallets which are not secured uh, but a little bit more in self-custody. You are in self-custody with software wallet and you have hardware wallets, which are, uh, for me, the best option so far. But when you use software wallet, there is some level of trust you have to uh, put into uh, the wallet manufacturer. Whether it is called Card, Trezor or, or Ledger, you have to trust a little bit us. You have to trust a little bit our vendor because we also depend on uh, different vendors, mostly for um, for the hardware itself. We, we are buying this, the circuit. So yes, the intent of this feature is to remove these uh, friction hurdles uh, for these people leaving their assets uh, on exchanges and get one step closer uh, to uh, self, self, self custody and self sovereignty. So when you use this feature, I agree, you are doing a small trade off where you are saying, I'm not completely self sovereign. I, I, I'm not the only one uh, able to, to, uh, to manage my, my backup. But the trade-off, I think, is acceptable because uh, the, the seed is split uh, in, into different shards. So there is no one custodian. That these are like part of the backup provider, providers. They don't custody your seed because cryptographically speaking, they don't have access to uh, your seed. Uh, this is a shard and with a shard, which is encrypted for security reason, but with a shard, you don't, you don't have any information about the secret. You have to, uh, to have at least two uh, out of the three shards in order to be able to recombine a secret and, uh, and uh, know uh, the, the wallet content and, and, and use it. So uh, this is, this is the, the trade-off you have. And also, yes, um, uh, in, in this, uh, in yesterday, in this, um, in this episode, like, I noticed that some people, not everyone, but some people uh, were a little bit uh, starting to understand like how her hardware wallet work, works. And, um, and uh, they, they were a little bit surprised to understand that the, the firmware or the software running inside uh, the secure element is something that can be changed, uh, is something that have an access to, uh, to the secret. But from a security standpoint, like nothing really changes, really. Like the seed is still generated within the secure element. The cryptographic operations are implemented within the secure element, like so that the seed doesn't have to leave the device when you use your crypto. And there is this trusted display allowing you to uh, consent for any, uh, any operation. And this part is really, really important. And it never changed. And as soon as the operating system will touch will touch a secret on your device, uh, it will ask you uh, for consent, whether it is like for uh, signing Bitcoin transaction, doing a smart contract interaction, staking on like Cosmos chain or any other chain, doing firmware update, downloading an app, or use a ledger recover service. For all these oper operations, and there are many other operations, for all these operations, the operating system needs to have an access to the secret, to the seed, in order to do some uh, cryptographic operation on it. And as soon as this happens, like the user is prompted and the user has to uh, consent for uh, the, this operation. If the user is, isn't happy with doing a firmware upgrade, it's simply declined and that's it. There was uh, uh, nothing happened. Is, is the user is not happy with the current Bitcoin transaction, he declines and that's it. There is uh, nothing happens. So we, we really must have this part in mind that of, of course the operating system has an access to uh, the cryptographic uh, materials, to the secret. But as soon as an operation uh, involves the, 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 the secret, the user is prompted and the, his consent is uh, requested. So this is, this is really the security model. And also there was um, something which was... Um, a little bit weird for, for some people. 
like this, the ability for uh, the firmware to be updated. And this part is really important. This is paramount. Well, security is not something static. Security is a journey. Like you, it's impossible to say, okay, I build a hardware wallet, I put uh, some like firmware and so on, and that's it. I won't ever be able to change anything. Like everything is uh, is engraved in the marble, and I can't change anything. If you do that, your uh, product won't be secure for a long, for a long time because, like as I said. Like security is a journey. You always have to improve uh, security to raise the bar for, for security. So we are doing quite often uh, upgrades in order to add new features, because uh, as you probably know, uh, there, are, there are plenty of new features in the blockchain ecosystem. New blockchain to support means new cryptography to implement. Um, uh, new features on Ethereum blockchain uh, means like uh, a specific support in uh, the Ethereum app or in the operating system. Like for instance, we, we have to support BLS just uh, for the deposit contract for Ethereum in order to, uh, to interact with uh, with the blockchain. And for that, that means we, we need to do a, a, a firmware upgrade and upgrade the operating system in order to uh, provide this, uh, this feature. Also, we are, we are integrating these days like the ENS integration within the device. That means you will be able to uh, send directly Ethereum to uh, Vitalik.eth if you want to send, uh, to send, them, to send him some, uh, some Ethereum. And on the device, you, you will have this resolution. And this requires some like, uh, uh, operating system upgrade. And the operating system uh, needs to, uh, to access to the, to the secret key. So yeah. The, 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 this is a, this was a little bit long, but I, I want to to give more um, uh, more color uh, to all of this. And frankly, I I learned two things yesterday. Uh, the, the the first thing is like the community cares a lot about about Ledger. Like when you have this kind of reaction, that means like things are important. Ledger is important for for the ecosystem. And frankly, this is this is touching for me for for, for us at Ledger. And the second, the second thing is like we we could have done a better job at explaining how all of this worked because uh, that was not completely clear for everyone. Yeah, I, I would de definitely echo um, both of those points that um, it, you know, people care so much about Ledger because this is sort of a I'm, we all have one. We've been Ledger users forever on the bankless journey. I mean, this is the non custodial hardware wallet that um, we recommend. That, um, that you know the community has has largely adopted. So so we we all very much care. And yeah, I would echo that. Um, man, the comms around this uh, was was real rough. And of course, like Twitter can get into all sorts of um, they they can mob attack. They they can pitchfork. Um, and uh, yeah, I do think this will be a learning lesson for Ledger moving forward and in, in how to explain this. But um, you've uncovered so many, you've talked about so many things, Charles. I feel like we need to kind of double back and get to, get to sort of the first section of this. And I do want in a little bit uh, for David and myself to pull up a visual of kind of like the, the hardware itself so that people don't leave this podcast episode without understanding the inside of how their ledger device might be working. But before we get there, the main concern on people's minds, you, you talked about um, two different kind of uh, user personas, I think Ledger is, is maybe appealing to. One is sort of the you know the crypto OG, the non custodial uh, maximalist side, and you know there there are few, very few that you know buy, buy a uh, brand new hardware laptop from uh, from Best Buy or something and like and like set it up from scratch, right? But there are a lot of people who depend on Ledger to be sort of their their uh, non-custodial crypto wallet where the private keys don't leave that particular device. And that's that's a lot of people on the bankless journey right now. And then there is a larger set of users that finds it very difficult. My my parents would be one of these, for, for instance. They would find it very difficult to actually set up a, a, you know, a hardware a wallet in Ledger and store those seed that seed phrase in a safe location. And what what Ledger is saying, hey, we want to appeal to that audience too, and we want to have a a, um, a product for them. And so there's this bifurcation, right? And what I think some of the the OG users are worried about is is that Ledger has forgotten about them somehow. And so one core question I have for you, and I want to make sure that people are clear on this. This recover service that we talked about, that is that is more for um, people who 
want to veer on the spectrum more towards a little bit more custody rather than than uh, self custody. Is this opt in or is this forced? Is this forced on everyone with a ledger device with a firmware update, or can they say no? Can they? Do they have to? Re- and if they can say no. How do they say no? Do they just not download the firmware? Is there a box you can check? Is is are is there a forked version of the software? Let's make sure we understand this first. Yeah, uh, if you don't like the service, you you don't even have to to say no. It's the it's the opposite. If you want the service, you you have to subscribe. You have to create an account. You have to go through uh, the identity identity verification process because this service works with uh, identity verification. And if you don't do that, like nothing happens. Like you don't subscribe to the service and nothing happens to your seed. Like it stays on, on your device completely uh, secure and that's it. So of course it's optional, completely optional. If you don't like the, this ID, like don't do anything. You can upgrade your firmware. You can upgrade your ledger live. Nothing will happen. So if I upgrade my firmware, this doesn't introduce some sort of difference. This doesn't introduce some sort of backdoor. This doesn't introduce some sort of way for um, Ledger through a software update to uh, you know extract out my private keys. Is that is what is different about this firmware upgrade versus previous uh, firmware upgrade? So anyone who's had a ledger for any number of years has obviously upgraded their 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 firmware. Why for security updates? Um, because they want additional support, more features, more competency, right? It's like no one has the original version of the, well, very few have the original version of the Ledger software. But what people are worried about is this new firmware update might um, degrade the, the, the security posture that Ledger has had on the, the firmware device so far. Can you, can you talk about that? No. So in short, no, it doesn't degrade the security posture uh, of, of uh, Ledger of uh, of uh, anything in in this area, um, as I as I mentioned, like it adds a new functionality that you can choose to use or not use. Um, but the operating system, like before this upgrade, the operating system has a full access to your secret, and as soon as you want to use this secret, you have to consent. After this upgrade, this is the this is the same thing. The operating system has still full access to uh, your seed. And as soon as uh, like something touches uh, your secret, you uh, have to consent. There is just a new feature, a new possibility uh, for like recover to, uh, to to be activated and to be used. And if you want to use it, like you will have to uh, consent on the device. Like, do you want to initialize initialize uh, um, a ledger recover uh, backup? Uh, phase and and then you will have to uh, to follow uh, the the plan on the device and uh, and the the full process will happen. So this this is this is this, there is this piece of of code inside the operating system uh, on top of what existing before what was existing before. But the same way we are adding new application and new feature, you don't have to use them. Like it's it's there. You if you don't like Bitcoin, uh, you just don't uh, uh, install the Bitcoin application. You don't uh, you don't sign transaction and that's it. In in this case, if you don't like this service, you simply don't have to use it. It's the same. And so I, th- I think at this point in this conversation, we need to unpack the guts of what makes a ledger a ledger. Uh, and so I think this uh, visual uh, that I believe Hasib made from scratch uh, is, is pretty useful here. And so I, I think listeners should just view a ledger as two boxes, one box inside of a bigger box. The bigger box is your ledger, the actual device. And inside of that ledger is this secure element. And that is the thing that houses the private key. And so the outside box is like, the computer, the device, the chip that manages the secure element, and then the secure element has the private key, and that is like the Fort Knox of your ledger. And I think why the the answer to the question, why is everyone so upset right now, is that people previously thought that the secure element, it's impossible for private keys to leave the secure element. That is the purpose of the secure element. Uh, and that is the design that, ever that that people talk about, the hardware walls. I say like, yeah, you get a hardware wallet because humans are messy and hardware wallets have one job, which is to not allow your private keys to leave the hardware wallet. And Charles, what you're saying is that that is still true. 
because you can sign a signature, you can approve a message on your ledger that requires human input to ever allow for private keys to leave the, to, for a signature to be signed. But what's different here in this new firmware update is that people are now understanding that that secure element also has software in it and firmware can update the software of the, sec of the secure element. And with this new firmware update, the software inside of the secure element is able to be updated in a way that can allow for the seed, the private keys to be escape, to escape from the hardware wallet. If you physically approve the hardware wallet, if it's in your hands and you hit the little checkbox that says approve, but it can now do that. And this product that Ledger is making is the, uh, as soon as you approve that, it shards it into three different shards. It encrypts each one twice, sends it to different custodians of the world. Probably the most secure way to secure a seed phrase, but people are now understanding that the secure element is actually software, not hardware. And this has caused people's concern. Is, it, uh, is this a good summary? I, f I think it's a, it's a good summary of the misunderstanding. What you need to understand, like the secure element is, is a circuit, is a circuit with low, low capacity processing, but uh, this part is true, with some uh, crypto accelerator. That means that there are pieces of hardware that can accelerate the cryptographic operation. But when I say, when I refer to ledger operating system, like this part is software, it's firmware, and this part is implemented inside the secure element. Like, it's possible for the keys to uh, not leave the secure element even, if, uh, even when you are doing uh, a signature because the operating system inside the secure element has access to the keys and can be upgraded. Like, I mean, when, 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 we added, uh, when we had the support for uh, BLS on, um, on, for Ethereum, for instance, that means that we have to add a new feature in the operating system. So we are uh, writing the code for uh, BLS support, and then we are upgrading our operating system so that now it supports BLS. And this operating system runs inside the secure element. Uh, when, when you think um, secure element, like secure element is a, is a small computer. Like there is a, a small uh, MCU, there is a dedicated RAM, there, there is a dedicated flash. Uh, there is um, a crypto accelerator. There are different uh, peripherals in order to communicate with the rest of the world. This is what a secure element is. And this secure element needs to run some code. Like this is not like something magic. Uh, and this code is the one we, uh, we wrote. And for years now, uh, this is an operating system. So we load our own operating system. There is an attestation mechanism. Uh, there, is some, uh, there are some integrity uh, checks in order to make sure that this is our code that runs inside and not another. Uh, there is, um, uh, yeah, there is a, the, the attestation allows to do this firmware upgrade over the air securely, because when you do a firmware upgrade, we want to make sure that the firmware comes from us. And then there is uh, all the uh, like secure channel attestation. Uh, at Ledger, we have uh, different checks and controls so that when you when we do uh, operating system upgrade, uh, we need, this uh, upgrade needs to be signed. So we have a multi-signature uh, process within Ledger so that to make sure that this new operating system version uh, does not introduce uh, like uh, uh, backdoors or, or bugs and so on. But this operating system runs inside the secure element. And this is the same with um, your Bitcoin application or Ethereum application. When you load your uh, Ethereum application, it's loaded inside the secure element and it, it runs on top of the operating system. Like if, if you think like, like a computer, like uh, the Nano is like the secure element is your computer. Uh, and the, inside the, the secure element, there, there is a flash, which which would be your hard drive. Uh, there is um, there is RAM uh, exactly as a, in your computer. There is an operating system like Linux. But it's really small, really smaller, and and very few features. It's mostly cryptographic and security oriented. And you can run apps uh, like um, uh, any app on on Linux. And and there the apps are Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, and others. This is the app that are, are running inside. So it's. Like I, it's a metaphor, it's a, it's a comparison, but I, I think it's quite uh, it's quite a, a fair one. If because what I realized that was some some people was uh, thinking that. 
there was some magic, like the, the, the seed is inside the secure element and we can add new features without uh, this feature touching the, the secret. No, it, it, can't, it, it can't work like that. Like that. Uh, the cryptography, um, signature, uh, encryption, um, uh, everything related to uh, the use of your assets needs to access to your seed. And as soon as we add new features, we upgrade this code so that uh, it can do it can it can do new things, but again with your consent, always. Okay. This is right. this, this thing never changed. Sure. And so I, I would imagine from the ledger perspective, uh, understanding how a ledger works, you, this update is released, and then in, from your from the ledger perspective, everyone is up in arms. It's like, oh, you can update the secure enclave, and you guys are like, yeah, we've been doing that this entire time. That's what yeah. that's what that's what firmware updates are. What what did you guys think was going on? But then from our perspective is like it's uh, it's specifically the nature of this update that has opened up some doors as to like what could happen in the future. And so like there's there's two doors that have opened, which is okay, now Ledger has made a product that opens up access to private keys on an opt-in basis. But what is down what is down that road? Like how easy does that get? Like there's now an API that goes to my private keys. That is an opt-in basis, but it, it raises concerns about like okay, well, what if a nation state comes and starts to twist Ledger's arm? And what happens if in one or two or five years, the doors to accessing my private keys are much larger than they are now? And then also, now there's an additional attack vector, which technically has always existed, but now we are more aware of it, is there's just one rogue firmware update away from uh, a, a, a rogue firmware update that would make accessing private keys uh, trivial. And so now we are all understanding that uh, if Ledger is compromised or some firmware update is compromised, that that could be a black swan event, if you will, because everyone's Ledger is compromised if we all download this new rogue firmware. So that's a new security vector, which I'm guessing, again, it's our, has always been there, but now we're aware of it. Um, do you have any thoughts or reflections on, on these concerns? Yeah, you're completely true, and it's it's true for every wallet, whether they are software or hardware. When they are hardware, it's a little bit more complex because you have to upgrade the firmware, and then you need some collaboration between like Ledger Live or the software uh, interfacing with the hardware. But yeah, you're you're totally true, uh, and this is the level of trust that I where I was mentioning before. When you use Ledger, there was there was some level of trust that you need to put into Ledger uh, so that we don't do a, a very nasty thing. And if you don't want to uh, to have any trust, as I as I said, it's it's really really complex. Uh, right. There is it's always a trade off between like, trust, security, and self sovereignty. And uh, it's yeah, it's 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 impossible to to be completely trustless. You would need you would need to be uh, to build your own computer because uh, if you want to be trustless, you can you can trust your own computer. And then you would need to build the software running on top of it. But when we're building software, you need a compiler. So how do you trust the compiler? You you're going to you 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 would need to build the entire stack that the the overall electronic and software industry uh, have been built during fifty years. So what I want to say, it's impossible uh, for one one human to be completely trustless in this process. And then the, the, it's a matter of trade-off. Like, where do you put the cursor or of I trust this guy for uh, managing uh, and providing me uh, the right tools and I'm completely self-sovereign. And this cursor mm -hmm. are plenty of different shades of, shades of gray. And uh, as, you, as you mentioned, I think like, some people realize that they were, they, were, they were trusting Ledger a little bit more than they thought. And I think this is, this is what happens yesterday. Learning about crypto is hard. Until now, introducing MetaMask Learn, an open educational platform about crypto, Web3, self-custody, wallet management, and all the other topics needed to onboard people into this crazy world of crypto. MetaMask Learn is an interactive platform with each lesson offering a simulation for the task at hand, giving you actual practical experience for navigating Web3. The purpose of MetaMask Learn is to teach people the basics of self-custody and wallet security in a safe environment. And while MetaMask Learn always takes the time to define Web3 specific vocabulary, vocabulary, it is still a jargon-free experience for the crypto-curious user. Friendly, not scary. 
MetaMask Learn is available in 10 languages with more to be added soon, and it's meant to cater to a global Web3 audience. So are you tired of having to explain crypto concepts to your friends? Go to learn.metamask.io and add MetaMask Learn to your guides to get onboarded into the world of Web3. Hiring people worldwide, paying them in crypto, providing them access to benefits, it all is so complex. But it doesn't have to be. Complying with labor laws, payroll rules, tax obligations, and crypto regulations in every country that you employ someone is difficult, time-consuming, manual, and costly. And it's drawing more and more attention from regulators and governments. But there is good news. Toku is here. Toku is the first employment and compensation platform for the crypto industry that makes this easy. Toku helps you hire employees or contractors and pay Pay them in fiat or crypto legally, compliantly, and with all the taxes handled in over a hundred different jurisdictions. So whether you're an early stage company with just a team of two, or you're an enterprise with 200, Toku has a solution that meets your needs. Toku is already working with the leading companies in the space, Protocol Labs, Hedera, Gitcoin, and many more. So transform your employment and token payroll operations with Toku. You can reach out to Toku at toku.com slash bankless, or click the link in the show notes. Introducing ETHX from Stator. ETHX is a liquid staking token designed to maximize rewards, all while securing Ethereum. With Stator, you can run an Ethereum node with just four ETH, an 85% lower capital requirement versus the 32 ETH required for solo staking. With Stator's four ETH nodes, you can get a 35% average higher yield, since you charge fees to those who use your node to stake their ETH. By running a node with Stator, the ETHX staking derivative token can get minted on your validators and can flow into the world of DeFi, which Stator is actively building integrations and partnerships into to increase the utility of ETHX. Stator allows for both permissioned and permissionless nodes to join the network, maximizing its potential scalability for ETHX while preserving the values of decentralization and openness behind its liquid staking token. Go to statorlabs.com ETH and sign up to get access to the Stator staking protocol. Arbitrum 1 is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum 1, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum 1 and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. I'm reminded of a, a metaphor that was used when uh, I actually remember this pretty clearly. Vitalik was on the Eric Weinstein's podcast and they were talking about the 2016 Ethereum DAO hack and the social contract of Ethereum at the time was completely autonomous, robots only, don't trust the humans. And then the DAO hack happened and then it was like this ro it was a robot and you rip the mask off the robot and there's a human there. And I think this is the, the same thing that's currently happening with Ledger is everyone thought it's like, oh, it's completely hardware. You don't have to trust humans. Uh, the hardware has got you. That's the whole point of, the, of a hardware wallet. And now with this understanding about like what a firmware update means and how deep a firmware update goes, people are now realizing that, oh, it's a human there. It's Ledger, which is a company of people that is uh, incorporated in France that uh, has founders and leadership. And so now I think the crypto world is now coming to terms with that and is now going to ask Ledger, the company, to make a very strong social contract to the crypto industry, to the crypto believers, the, the crypto hardliners, if you will, which are causing this uproar about how are you with now that this new attack vector is opened up, this can of the, the genies out of the bottle, how are you guys going to sign a social contract on our behalf, and is that even possible? I think that is kind of the question that everyone's learning how to ask right now, including myself. Yes, it's a good one. I, I think like the, the social contract uh, is is what I said before. As soon as like the software, the firmware is touching your secret, like it's up to your consent. There is a, always, you need to authenticate yourself. Always the, everything starts with the pin. And after the pin, like as soon as something touch your secret uh, to do like sensitive operation, uh, I'm not saying uh, generating a, a public key. You you have to launch the to launch the Ethereum app first, but yeah. Uh, but for everything related to uh, using private keys and so on, you are always prompted and you you need to uh, consent for that. 
and this contract never changed. Uh, and at some point, you you need to trust us for not putting backdoors. And for this, there is there is no real choice, and it's always the case for every uh, single wallet uh, vendors, whether it is uh, it is hardware or, or even software. What's interesting, so I. Okay, so I, I'm hearing this loud and clear. There's really like two levels of consent on the device before you know allowing this, and that's just on the device, allowing this kind of recover service. One is you update the firmware, right? So there, there could be a swath of people listening to this saying, I you know, am not going to update the firmware. And that if so, that's your choice. You, you, you bought the hardware device, you don't have to update the firmware if you don't want to. But, but this, it's a bad idea. It's a bad it's idea. A bad because... idea. Well, I, let me get back to that. But it's like, yeah. the, so that, that is a first thing you have to do. A second thing is um, uh, there's actual physical approval from a ledger if you want to, if anytime it's going to act, uh, touch your secret. And so opt you, like get you into the recovery service. There's something you have to actually click approve on your ledger device. So there's kind of two layers here. Now, getting back to it's a bad idea, right? To not update your firmware. Th this is kind of the, the trade off spectrum I, th I think people had. Like, how to bankless sister i guess and to myself i'm asking me this question how certain am i that the existing firmware version on my ledger device uh, doesn't have a security flaw in it like i don't know i mean this is part of what um a company like ledger i imagine provides is when you identify any sort of security flaw or some sort of issue um you kind of patch that you you fix the bug and you require or you ask for a firmware update from all of your users right so that's kind of an unknown for me in addition to like the whole world of all of the features that um i might want in the future for my ledger device so that's kind of a, a choice you have to make is like how secure is your existing the existing version of of your firmware you really don't know and what if a flaw is uncovered who, who do you kind of trust to um to patch that up uh, so that, that is kind of the trade-off, but you wanted to say something here, Charles. Yeah, the, the, what I wanted to say is it's a bad idea to uh, not update your, your firmware because uh, in firmware updates, there are, there are always security improvements. Some, sometimes it's, it's even a, a vulnerability fix. There was, and we are completely transparent about that. You can go on dungeon.ledger.com slash LSB for Ledger Security built in. And every, every time we, we uncover a new vulnerability, whether it is our teams or external teams, we are first fixing them and then we are, uh, we are publishing the Ledger Security built in. And, and to be completely transparent, like a few days, weeks ago, we, we, have, we have found something quite interesting on the implementation of Miniscript. We are uh, we are among the the only one supporting well Miniscript, and there was a team um, uh, integrating like this Miniscript implementation, and they found uh, something uh, uh, something quite interesting, a vulnerability. So we worked with them, we fixed the vulnerability, and if your Bitcoin app is up to date, you uh, you this vulnerability is fixed. Uh, if you're not now, uh, the attacker knows the vulnerability because now it's public. And you are vulnerable, so that's why it's really important to um, to to always uh, update your firmware and, and and the application. This is such a hard situation for for I think users who who want to be completely bankless and and uh, self sovereign to to be in because we have to sort of make a, a choice. We have to, and I I guess maybe the question goes to like D David is pointing to sort of the social contract that Ledger can make um, to say we believe in self custody. Um, you know, the, we we can. We believe in, uh, you know, kind of transparency. We um, are going to do our best to kind of protect your device at all times and keep your private keys in the secure uh, enclave and only ask your permission if, if you know, something changes. But um, I, I'm wondering if we can even get stronger on because crypto is very much an industry of like, don't trust, but verify, right? And so like, is there a way that, crypto a listener can have assurances that ledger hasn't introduced some sort of backdoor like can we open source this is is that not a avenue is there is there some way to guarantee this i mean i don't even want to rely on like third party auditors here but you see what i'm saying it's just like um how can we be sure that a future ledger firmware update does not introduce some sort of a backdoor 
right? Because, you know, Ledger's now a large company. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure there are author- authorities. I'm sure there are nation states who uh, somewhere on the planet would like to introduce some sort of backdoor into a future uh, firm- firmware update. And um, yeah, how, how, how can we verify that this indeed hasn't happened? Do we just have to basically trust at the social contract layer that you haven't done that? So first, first I, I'm going to start with the social contract. And again, we, we are pro self-custody. Like this is, this is the purpose of Ledger. We would like that everyone to be completely uh, self-sovereign and completely in self-custody. And I, as I mentioned, like in this self-custody journey, there are different shades of gray. And, and there are, the reality is that today we are very few in self-custody. Okay, I'm, it's important for me, it's important for you. But at the end, this, what, what is this part of the crypto ecosystem? Most of people are using Robinhood to buy uh, Bitcoin or are leaving their Bitcoin on an exchange. This is the situation, the situation right now. So how can we make sure that these people come a little bit closer to self-custody? And I think this kind of feature goes in that direction. I would love that everyone understands very well that self-custody is the purpose of blockchain revolution. This is something I say like every time I, 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 I can speak. But the reality is that's not the case right now. Most people are using Bitcoin as, it's, as, as they were speculating on stocks. This is not the purpose of like crypto, Ethereum, or, or Bitcoin. The, the, the purpose is self-custody. You have to own your own value to be permissionless, to be as trustless as possible. I, I, I am completely uh, aware of this. Ledger is aware of this. This is the ethos of the company. Now, how can we bring these people into self-custody? And I think this feature is part of this. Like, so the social contract is we are continuing our road to empower people, to give them the right tools uh, to be in self-custody, to really own their value. This is what we do. Uh, this does not change. And about your comment about um, uh, a state forcing us to put back doors and so on. Yeah, I, what, what can I answer to that? Like, this, this is always true for, for everyone. Like, yeah, okay, that was, that was true yesterday. This, this, this will be true tomorrow. Uh, and it's difficult to uh, prove the absence, uh, the absence of, uh, of any backdoor. Um, about open sourcing our operating system, this is, uh, this is uh, like a, a very um, a long story. Like uh, we are talking about that at Ledger, we are talking about that uh, every everywhere we can. A lot of people are asking us to uh, to open source our, our operating system. I would love to. The problem is uh, we are using Secure Element. Secure Element is like the best device you can uh, you can imagine to implement cryptography, to store secrets, and so on. This is why we are using Secure Element. But when you are using Secure Element, you sign an NDA with uh, the Secure Element providers, and the Secure Element provider simply like prevent you to, uh, to, to give any information about how their secure, secure, secure Element is working. Because there, there is their IP, because uh, there are plenty of um, of uh, proprietary, proprietary uh, security countermeasure, and they don't want uh, these things to be uh, to be public. So we simply can't uh, publish our uh, operating operating system uh, source, source code because of this. And I think the uh, something which is really interesting in open source is the capacity for everyone to audit the code. But does it does not guarantee that people will audit the code, and this is this is a big blind spot uh, uh, in 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 the in the ecosystem. A lot of code are open source, but no one audit them, and no one pays for audit, and it does not happen. Okay, our, our source code is not open source, at least the oper- operating system. The applications are. You can you can uh, you can audit them if if you want, but the operating system is not because of uh, what I just said. Nonetheless, like we are internally auditing, and we have one of the best team in the in the world uh, in terms of security, the Danjan. They are uncovering uh, security flaws like in in many different imp- implementation, in ours also uh, sometimes, and then we are improving things. We are also using third party uh, to um, to to audit our code. We are also getting through a security certification, like so that you have you have a third party that uh, go through a complete audit of your product code and so on to make sure uh, it's uh, it's not possible to uh, to go through the to to uh, 
yeah, to, 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 to bypass the security feature. And this is, this is what we do. Uh, but for, for hardware, especially for hardware, because open source is especially interesting when it comes to software. Like uh, you, uh, you, have, um, you use a, a specific uh, version of uh, a software, and then this software is open source. What you will do is uh, clone the GitHub repository, you will compile it, and then you can compare this to uh, the, the binary that is distributed. You can even run the, the version that you compile yourself. Not a lot of people are doing this, but this is something you can. But with hardware and with firmware, it's very difficult to have guarantees that the software which is running inside the hardware wallet is the, the same that is, be, that is uh, being distributed by the vendor. So even if we were open source, completely open source, you would have like very uh, large difficulty to make sure that the, the, the operating system running in the device is the same that you downloaded. And it's the same problem with cold card, it's the same problem with, uh, with Trezor. You, you don't have guarantee. Yeah. By the way, Trezor, uh, recently they, um, they, they got some people uh, distributing like fake uh, Trezor device, like with uh, backdoor inside. And as there is no integri integri uh, integrity mechanism, there is no way for people to distinguish a real Trezor from a fake one. Because everything is the same, and and uh, and you have no way to make to be sure that the version uh, which is inside uh, the Trezor is a, is a white one or, or a fake one. This is this is a problem you have with uh, with hardware wallet with yeah. hardware in general. Uh, Charles, you said um, we need innovations like Ledger Recover to be able to onboard like the Robin Hoods of the world, the the very very banked people of the world. Stuff yeah. like this can make them more bankless. Uh, and, uh, I, that's one half of me is like, absolutely. Let's, let's get the rest of the world into the world of, of sovereign private keys. And then the other half of me is like, don't compromise on my Fort Knox in my hand, in my hardware wallet, just because some Robin hood bros want to come into crypto. <laughs> and so like, there's, there's like two, there's like two sides that I can see here. There's like, yeah, we need more people to come into crypto. Let's make it easier for them but also don't compromise on like how strong I can be self-sovereign. And so the, the, the uh, one topic of conversation that's been floating around in my circles about this has been like, well, can't there just be two firmwares? One is like the Robin Hood, uh, Robin Hood bro people that want to come in and, uh, and want to be, get their first uh, hardware wallet in a way that feels good. And then can there be a second firmware, which is like the Fort Knox for the crypto extremists who want the maximum level of security? And so the, I, I'll, I'll raise that. But also, I think, I think the point that we're learning here is that even if you do make the Fort Knox version, if you do like split the uh, split the firmwares into two paths, like the hardcore and the easy modes, the it's actually kind of uh, superfluous, as in like it's the same risk risk vectors either way, and that's perhaps like kind of the frustration of Ledger is like sure you can have your Fort Knox version of the firmware, but like you actually aren't reducing any of the the well, risk. It's because anytime you uh, you do a firmware update, it just kind of right. you reset the clock. It's the same you. thing, yeah. Uh, and so like this is that kind of like I, I see the rock and the hard place that that Ledger is in, um, but I'll I'll float the idea of like a second firmware a Fort Knox firmware that will just make people feel good and maybe that's a maybe that's something See, it's it's an idea but again I don't I don't think it resolve your uh, your concern right. in all cases you will have to trust ledger a little bit the, right being completely trustless as I mentioned is something really difficult you would have to to build the entire stack from scratch and, right. and, and this is this really has got difficult. to be true for for our all hardware wallets, right? Just our hard, hardware wallets as a vertical. If hardware this is going to be true for that, or, or even right. software wallets, right? Yeah, it's the same. There, there was there was a, there was a part of uh, of trust inside, of course. So I think this and, is kind of just a learning are, moment for the entire yeah, industry so. as to how how a hardware wallet works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, frankly, I, I'm a bit disappointed because I. I thought I did a hard right. uh, work explaining how all of this works and so on, but <laughs> if it was not clear for everyone, now it's a little bit better. Well, sometimes it takes these events, uh, Charles, to, uh, so that um, you know the the information the education can can really uh, propagate. So I, I'm curious that as you as you zoom out on this on this whole thing, um, what is kind of the the learning lesson for uh, Ledger about this um, event uh, or this discussion over the last couple of days? And then what do you think is the, the learning, uh, the takeaway for the rest of crypto? 
Um, so one of the first takeaway is like in terms of communication, sh sh things sh could have been really better. The thing is, uh, we planned to announce it like officially, we explaining everything and so on. We we had a solid uh, communication plan uh, for uh, for a little bit earlier, um, uh, for for a little bit later. Uh, the the thing is, uh, when we, uh, we we wanted to be ready when we launch uh, to be able for users to upgrade their, their firmware. So we we needed to uh, distribute the firmware uh, beforehand. And as we are transparent in the release notes, we explain that this new firmware contain uh, the the capability uh, to uh, to activate uh, the ledger recover. And the thing is, instead of Bring, bringing to the crypto ecosystem this new idea, how it works, and uh, if you don't like it, you don't have to use it. This is the community that discovered uh, the functionality and, and started to speculate. Oh, they, they are extracting my seed and so on. Like a lot of FUD started. And we, instead of for us to explain the feature, the, the ID, the intent, the fact that it does not change anything in terms of uh, security model and, and the, the user uh, contract with, with Ledger. Uh, instead of being in that situation, we uh, spent like 24 hours explaining that, no, we are not in installing any kind of backdoor. And by the way, you didn't completely understand how hardware wallet works. <laughs> so yeah, this is, so in terms of communication, like uh, the point taken, uh, of course, uh, things could have been better. The second takeaway for me is, I, as I mentioned, like the, the crypto uh, community, the ecosystem cares a lot about Ledger. Frankly, uh, when you see this kind of passion, this kind of, even if it's not positive passion, uh, the, the, this, means, this means a lot for me. This is touching and, uh, and uh, yeah, the, 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 mes the message uh, has been received. Uh, the third takeaway is, um, as I mentioned, like we, we could have explained better what's the security model, what's the uh, how a uh, hardware wallet works, and so on. I feel we we spend a lot of time like explaining these things again and again. Um, probably the, that was not enough, uh, of course. And uh, and sometimes like I mean the company for more than than five years, and sometimes I, I feel I explained this like ten times. But th what what I explained in 2017, I explained it to like uh, one percent of the people who are in the community right now. So uh, this is a uh, this uh, is and, something. And, and people forget, Charles. You know. Yeah, and, and people <laughs> forget. Yeah, people forget. Of course. I, I'm not always thinking about how the inside of my ledger works, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So yeah, so this is a never-ending uh, story. We, we we need to continue uh, doing the, the this effort, explaining well uh, what's the what's the trade-off when you use uh, Ledger because it's always a matter of trade-off. There was no like perfectly trustless, secure, um, and um, and self-sovereign uh, solution. This thing does not happen. It does not exist. You, it's it's always a matter of of trade-off. I think the trade-off that Ledger is providing as a lot of value as a customer as a user I love I love this the, the value provided uh, provided by Ledger and and then I would like that there's Robin Hood people to get a little bit of this of this value and this this is the intent of the of the Ledger recover um, and yeah again also we are in the Twitter echo, echo chamber and Twitter is not really the real world. Let's keep this in mind. <laughs> this is not the real world. Yeah, I, I, I certainly have that uh, the top of mind. Well, I, th I think we've all learned a lot uh, over the last couple of days and, and certainly I hope Bankless listeners have in this episode. But I, I want to ask this kind of uh, final question. And this we've been talking about a new cohort of users that, that Ledger wants to get, kind of the, you know, the Robin Hood crowd, the people who are not comfortable with the hardware wallet and their seed phrase um, as is. And I think some of the OGs, part of this, you know, this passion you've seen comes from a, an emotional place. And what they're saying, Charles, is uh, you guys aren't going to forget about us, are you? Like, oh, no, 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 we won't. I, I'm part of this, guys. I'm, okay. I'm, our voice is uh, at Ledger. <laughs> so, so, so tell me about that, because I think that's where this is coming from. There are a lot of people who started their bankless journey with a hardware wallet and, and used Ledger. And the reason they did that is for maximum self sovereignty and they want to feel like the company whose product they own supports them on that journey and hasn't changed and ledger has grown a lot over the last few years um certainly a new uh, round of funding as well the team size has grown and i think some of the ogs are basically saying 
hey, Ledger, you're not going to forget why you're here. You're not going to forget about this mission. And the, the reason I know that is because um, they ask Bankless the exact same questions, right? Bankless has also grown and they are continually asking us, hey, do you guys still remember why you're here? Like the mission, like the reason we're doing this thing? And I think they are now through this episode in an impassioned way, in a pitchfork way, in a Twitter mob attack type way, but also in a good way. They're asking Ledger, why are you still here? Do you know? Do you know the mission? You haven't forgotten about us, have you? So what would you say to that? Yeah, I think I mentioned this point already, but uh, I'm very happy to to say it again. Like the, the mission of Ledger is to provide the users with tools to be empowered, to be in self custody, in 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 self sovereignty, because this is the purpose of like the blockchain revolution. The purpose is is not about like speculating speculating about uh, with uh, Bitcoin as you would speculate with stocks. Frankly, this this thing is not interesting I, from my standpoint. And and by the way, this is definitely not the mission of Ledger. Like the mission is to provide uh, our our users with tools to own their value, to use it securely, and to be completely self sovereign. And the thing is that in this mission, if you only uh, talk to like core hard uh, hardcore user that. Uh, or that understands this very uh, uh, very well, uh, you 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 are completely blind to a big world who would like to enter this world, and this is also what we what we are doing. We are not forgetting the ethos like this. This um, doesn't change. We are just trying to make sure that everyone, every the mass adoption will understand this ethos. We we want make to make sure they understand and and, and we're moving a little bit the friction point for them uh, to to enter into self custody and self sovereignty because again this is really uh, the, the the purpose of of Bitcoin of Ethereum of blockchain in general and. And uh, personally speaking, this is also what motivates me to, to be at Ledger. I truly believe in, in this mission. And I, I don't feel there is another player in the crypto ecosystem which is such committed to, uh, to self-custody and self sovereignty. So this does not change. But we also have to keep in mind that the OG of like 2014 or 2017 are only a small portion of the ocean of crypto users today. And we have to talk to everyone. We don't forget the OG, but we, 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 we have to, uh, to talk to everyone. And by the way, frankly, sometimes I'm a little bit disappointed by uh, the OG community. We, we are investing a lot on supporting uh, plenty of uh, Bitcoin uh, features uh, and, and same with Ethereum. And at the end, when we have a look to the stats, not much people are using it, using them. So th- there is this this thing which is a little bit um, disappointing for me. And like we are investing a lot to to make sure that the, this OG population has the right tools and so on. And at the end, they don't use them so much. So, but we won't stop. <laughs> I'm just saying a, that, this. That's a good point to end it with. And the reason I asked again is because I just wanted to hear it one more time. Uh, from your mouth, Charles. Thank you so much for engaging the community in this way in podcast form. I think um, discussions are much easier than uh, than Twitter battles uh, back and forth. And we appreciate you taking the time to to come on and explain this today. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity. That was a really good discussion, open discussion. And yeah, happy, happy to, to have participated. Awesome. Bankless Nation, uh, risks and disclaimers, of course, none of this has been financial advice. You know it wasn't because you're listening to Bankless. I got to let you know, again, a reminder in case you needed reminding, Bitcoin, ETH, these assets are risky. So is DeFi. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. 